it is 1620, and Europe is in turmoil. Two years before, Protestant Bohemian rebels took up arms against Ferdinand II's Catholic rule, starting the Thirty Years' War. And now, the rebels are preparing for the Battle of White Mountain. Ferdinand II's rule as a devout Catholic caused immediate turmoil in non-Catholic subjects of Bohemia. Due to Bohemia's abundance of Protestants, many rose up in revolt, triggering what is famously known as the Bohemian Rebellion. Charge! By 1620, at the Battle of White Mountain, Ferdinand crushed the Protestant rebels with the support of the Catholic League, Spain, and Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The Protestants were no match for the King's army. Within an hour, the battle ended. Around 4,000 Bohemians were killed, while the Catholics lost roughly 700. With the Protestant army in shambles, King Ferdinand was able to seize firm control over the Bohemian estates. He ordered all Calvinists and Lutherans to leave his realm or to convert to Catholicism. Ferdinand II seized land of Protestant nobles and gave them to his Catholic nobles. With religious unity among his subjects, the king's power increased. As Ferdinand's Catholic military succeeded more and more, Ferdinand issued the Edict of Restitution, which would return all previously Protestant lands back to the Catholics. Ferdinand's growing Catholic empire led Louis XIII of France and Cardinal Richelieu to enter the war on the Protestant side, adding to the turmoil. In 1635, Ferdinand signed the Peace of Prague with hopes of ending combat. However, this proved unsuccessful as Ferdinand would die two years later, leaving an empire entangled in war to his son Ferdinand III. Even before his ascension to the throne of the empire, Ferdinand III enacted the Revised Land Ordinance of 1627 as King of Bohemia, which deprived his subject of raising an army, perhaps in response to the original Bohemian Revolt. The Peace of Westphalia, which was negotiated partly by his diplomats, ended the Thirty Years' War in 1648, and in theory ended religious conflicts in Europe forever. However, Protestant subjects of the Habsburg monarchy would agitate for greater autonomy for years to come. Ferdinand III continued to build state power throughout his reign, occasionally giving local princes power in order to gain favor with them. Empowered by the imperial government, the land nobility took charge of economic recovery. The nobles increased the burdens of serfdom and profited from the war's population losses to take over vast tracts of land. With technical and commercial innovations, they created a new form of capitalism, market-oriented agriculture, which allowed them to increase their holding even more at the expense of smaller landowners. We need our harvest this year. Let's go. The nobles maintained strict control over their serfs. Bound to the land, the serfs weren't allowed to leave the farm. Those who fled were punished. On the whole, however, Frederick III centralized the government in the hereditary German-speaking provinces which formed the core Habsburg holdings, and for the first time a permanent standing army was put in place to put down any internal opposition. Ferdinand died in 1657, leaving the throne to Leopold I, whose reign would change the face of Austria forever. When Leopold ascended to the throne, his empire was at war with the mighty Ottoman Empire. Fighting went on intermittently until 1664, when a 20-year truce was reached between Leopold and the Turkish Grand Vizier. Following several years of peace, Leopold was forced to fight against his cousin, King Louis XIV of France, following his campaign against the United Provinces of the Netherlands, and then again during the War of Réunion when Louis invaded the German Rhineland. Even though he took part in an alliance with other European powers, Leopold had one hand tied behind his back because the truce with the Ottomans had ended, and in 1683, the armies of the Grand Vizier were at the gates of Vienna. The Turks besieged the city for three months, until a combined force of several European powers, led by Jan Tversky III of Poland, assisted Leopold in pushing back the Ottoman forces. In the subsequent Great Fish Wars, the Holy League, with Leopold's generals at its time, succeeded in conquering large swaths of land for Austria, expanding its reach in southeastern Europe. During this time, Leopold led another coalition against Louis XIV in the Nine Years' War, which had been sparked by both the Glorious Revolution in England and, and France's invasion of Germany. 
Just as this war ended and the Turks surrendered at Zenta in 1697, the War of Grand Succession began in 1700, which saw Leopold craft a brilliant strategy that would secure Austrian Habsburg's interest in Spain by the end of the war. However, by Leopold's death, insurrection was brewing in Hungary, and Francis II and Rakotsev had begun rebelling against the Habsburgs. So despite Leopold's military, military successes, um, perhaps his greatest, greatest achievements were in the reforms he, uh, he uh, uh, achieved in um, his, his administration of his empire. Um, in 1663, for example, he put the Regensburg Diet in permanent session, uh, really expanding the power of the monarchy in the Habsburg Empire. Um, and despite the fact that the, um, that the Habsburg dynasty did suffer some blows to their power by revolts and, inst and instability in Hungary and Transylvania, um, it was Leopold's real long-lasting contributions to the power of, of, of his dynasty that, that strengthened the monarchy years after his death. Despite the checks on their ambitions in Hungary, the Habsburg made significant achievements in state building by forging consensus with the church and the nobility. A sense of common identity and loyalty to the monarchy grew among elites in Habsburg lands. By the end of the 17th century, Emperor Leopold commanded an outstanding army of 100,000 men, funded by contributions from the provincial estates. German became the language of the common culture, and with ongoing Protestant conversion and emigration, zealous Catholicism had, had helped fuse a common identity. Vienna had become the cultural and ideological center of the empire, and by 1700 it was a thriving city with a population of 100,000, with the royal palace at Schönbrunn. Following the brief reign of Joseph I, Charles VI ascended to the throne of Austria in 1711, just after the de defeat of the Hungarian revolt. Despite the defeat of Rakocz's forces uh, by the Austrians, they didn't have to accept many compromises with the Hungarians. Um, and what many people don't really realize is that Charles VI had to uh, restore a lot of nobles' power in the region and restore all the princes to their former positions. And thus, Hungary was never fully integrated into the empire as many people think it was. Charles VI proclaimed the Pragmatic Sanction, which stated that Habsburg possessions were never to be divided, even if it meant allowing a woman to take the throne. Lacking a male heir, Charles spent much of his reign trying to get his principles accepted within and beyond his realm. Successes resulted in the crowning of his daughter, Maria Theresa, upon Charles' death in 1740. This was not the end of the monarchy's troubles, however. The War of Austrian Succession plagued Maria Theresa's reign for eight long years, and only after it ended was she recognized as the legitimate heir of Charles VI. This queen would go on to change Austria forever, representing the peak of absolutism in the empire and strengthening the monarchy that no king had before her had. Her legacy, and that of the Habsburgs, would go on for centuries to come.